Hello, welcome to another episode of the Resident Evil City of the Dead audiobook. We are starting today with chapter 14, but before we do, I'd like to make a couple of shout outs to people in the comments from our last video. Mac Curtis, as always, thank you very much. Absolutely hilarious. Yes, Mr. X, the cyborg parasite, enhanced his by his only weakness is small doorways. Certainly, I don't think we're going to get any explanation for some of those quirks of Mr. X in this. I don't think there's going to be a chapter where we see that Umbrella accidentally programmed some sort of weird fear of rooms that have. Uh, typewriters in them to explain why he doesn't go into safe rooms. Um, and Christopher Johnson, thanks very much. It was really nice to see you uh, pop onto the uh, YouTube video, leave us a comment. I really love it. Okay, we're going to carry on now with chapter 14. And chapter 14 brings us back to police chief Brian Irons, one of the creepiest men in Resident Evil. So beautiful. Even in death, Beverly Harris was radiant, but Irons couldn't risk having her wake up while he wasn't watching. He carefully folded her into the stone cabinet beneath the sink and latched it, promising himself that he would take her out when he had more time. She would become the most exquisite animal he'd ever transformed, posed and forever perfect once he'd prepared her the proper way. A dream come true. If I have time. If there's any time left. He knew he was feeling sorry for himself again, but there was no one else to commiserate with. No one to marvel at the sheer magnitude of all that he'd suffered. He felt terrible, sad and angry and alone, but he also felt that things had finally become clear. He knew now, knew why he was being persecuted, and that awareness had given him a focus. As depressing as the truth was, at least he was no longer lost. Umbrella. An umbrella conspiracy to destroy me. All along. Ian sat on the scarred, stained table in the sanctuary, his special, private place, and wondered how long it would be before the young woman came for him. The one with the athletic body. The one who'd refused to tell him her name. In a way... She was responsible for his newfound clarity, an irony that he couldn't help but appreciate. It had been her sudden appearance that had provided him with the truth. She would find him, of course. She was an Umbrella spy, and Umbrella had obviously been watching him for quite some time. They probably had lists of everything he owned, volumes of psychological profiling reports, even copies of his financial records. It all made sense. Now that he'd had some time to think, he was the most powerful man in Raccoon, and Umbrella had designed his downfall, tailored each vicious backstab to cause him the most acute agony possible. Iron stared at his treasures, the tools and trophies that sat on the shelves in front of him, but felt none of the pride that they usually inspired. The polished bones were simply something to look at as his mind worked, absorbed with Umbrella's treachery. Years before, when he'd started taking money to turn the blind eye to the company's doings, things had been different. Then it had been a matter of politics, of finding himself a niche in the power structure that really controlled Raccoon. And things had worked smoothly for a long time. His career had progressed on schedule. He'd earned the respect of officials and citizens alike, and, for the most part, his investments had paid off. Life had been good. And then there was Birkin. William Birkin and his neurotic wife and their brat daughter. After the Spencer estate spill, he'd almost convinced himself that the stars and goddamn Captain Wesker had been responsible for all the trouble. But he could see now that it was the arrival of Birkin and his family nearly a year before that had started the ball rolling. The destruction of the Spencer lab had only hurried things along. Umbrella had probably started monitoring him the day he'd had the misfortune to meet Birkin. At first, just watching, planting bugs and installing cameras. The spies would have come later. The Birkins had come to Raccoon so that William could concentrate on developing a superior synthesis of the T-virus based on the research being done at the Spencer lab. 
a quirky and unpleasant as William sometimes could be, Irons had liked him, right from the start. The male Birkin had been Umbrella's boy genius, but like Irons, he wasn't the type to brag about his position. William was a humble man, only interested in fulfilling his own potential. They'd both been too busy to have much of a friendship, but there had been a mutual respect between them. Irons had often felt that William looked up to him. Then my mistake was to allow it, to allow my regard for him to cloud my instincts, to keep me from noticing that I was being watched all along. The loss of the Spencer lab sent some big ripples through Umbrella's hierarchy, and only days after the explosion, Irons had been approached by Annette Birkin with a message from her husband. A message and a request for a favour. Birkin had been worried that Umbrella was going to demand a new synthesis, the G-Virus, before it was ready. Apparently, he'd been most dissatisfied with the application of his previous work. Something about how Umbrella hadn't let him perfect the replication process. Irons couldn't remember exactly what and with Umbrella looking to recover from the financial blow of the Spencer loss, Birkin had been concerned that they might compromise the integrity of the untested virus. Through Annette, Birkin had asked for assistance, and offered him a little extra incentive to keep things fair. For a hundred grand, all Irons had to do was help keep the G-Virus under wraps. In short, watch out for Umbrella spies and keep an eye on the surviving stars making sure they didn't do any more discovering of Umbrella's research. That was it. A hundred thousand dollars, and I was already watching my city and keeping tabs on that rebellious little pack of troublemakers. Easy. Easy money. And more to be made if everything went as planned. Except it was a trap. An Umbrella trap. Irons had walked right into it. And that was when Umbrella had started plotting against him, using the information they gathered to seal his fate. How else could things have gone wrong so quickly? The stars had disappeared, then Birkin, and before he'd even had a chance to assess the situation, the attacks had started up again. He'd barely had time to seal Raccoon off before everything had fallen to shit. And all because I was helping a friend. For the greater good of the company, no less. Tragic. Irons stood up and walked slowly around the cutting table, idly tracing the dents and scars in the wood with his fingertips. Behind every mark was a story, a memory of accomplishment, but again he could take no comfort. The cool, quiet atmosphere of the sanctuary had always soothed him before. It was where he practiced his hobbies, where he was truly able to be himself. But it wasn't his anymore. Nothing was. Umbrella had taken it from him, just as they'd taken his city. Was it so far-fetched to deduce that they'd unleashed their virus to get at him? To rob him of his power? And then sent that scantily clad brown-haired girl to rub his nose in it? Why else was she so attractive? They knew his weaknesses and were exploiting him, trying to keep him from retaining even a shred of dignity. And soon she'll come for me. Maybe still playing dumb, still trying to seduce me with her helplessness. An umbrella assassin, a spy and an exploiter, that's all she is. Probably laughing at me behind that pretty face. Maybe the spill had been an accident. The last time they'd met, William Burke had seemed unsteady, paranoid and exhausted. And accidents happened even under the best circumstances. But the rest was fact. There was no other explanation for how completely Irons had been ruined. That girl was coming to get him. She was from Umbrella, and she'd been sent to murder him. And she wouldn't stop there. Oh no. She'd find Beverly and... and defile her somehow. Just to make certain that nothing he cared about was left. Irons looked around the small, softly lit room that had once been his gazing wistfully at the well-used tools and furniture. The sweet, familiar smells of disinfectant and formaldehyde emanating from the rugged stone walls. My sanctuary. Mine. 
He picked up the handgun that lay on his special cutting table, the VP-70 that was still his, and felt a bitter smile curl his lips. His life was over. He knew that now. This whole affair had started with Birkin and would end here, by his own hand. But not yet. The girl would come for him and he would kill her before he said his final goodbyes to Beverly, before he admitted his defeat by taking a bullet. But he would see to it that she understood his suffering first. For every torture he'd endured, the girl would pay. The bill settled through flesh and bone, and as much pain as he could inflict. He was going to die, but not alone, and not without hearing the girl scream in agony, creating a voice for the death of his dreams. A voice so clear and true that the echoes would reach even the black hearts of the company executives who had betrayed him. The star's office was empty, cluttered and cold, layered with dust. But Claire was reluctant to leave. After her stumbling, frightened flight through the body-strewn halls of the second floor, finding the place where her brother had spent his working days had left her feeling weak with relief. Mr. X hadn't followed her, and although she was still anxious to help Sherry and find Leon, she found herself lingering, afraid to step back into the lifeless halls, and hesitant to leave the one place that felt like Chris. Where are you, big brother? And what am I gonna do? Zombies, fire, death, your weird chief irons and that lost little girl. And just when I thought things couldn't get any more insane, I get a face off with the thing that would not die. The freak to end all freaks. How am I gonna get through this? She sat at Chris's desk, gazing at the small strip of black and white pictures that she'd found tucked in the bottom drawer. The four shots were of the two of them, grinning and making faces. A photo booth memento of the week they'd spent in New York last Christmas. Finding this strip had made her want to cry at first. All of the fear and confusion she'd been holding back finally surging to the front at the sight of his well-loved smile. But the longer she'd looked at him, at the two of them laughing and having a good time, the better she'd started to feel. Not happy, or even okay and no less afraid of what was to come. Just better, calmer, stronger. She loved him, and knew that wherever he was, he loved her back, and that if the two of them had been able to survive the loss of both their parents, to build lives for themselves, and share a silly Christmas vacation in spite of having no real home to go to, then they could cope with anything. She could cope. Can and will. I'm going to find Sherry and Leon and, God willing, my brother. And we're going to make it out of Raccoon. The truth was, she didn't really have any choice. But she needed to go through the process of accepting her lack of options before she could act. She'd heard before that real bravery wasn't an absence of fear. It was accepting the fear and doing what was necessary anyway. And once she'd sat for a moment, thinking about Chris... She thought that she could do just that. Claire took a deep breath, slipped the photos into her vest, and pushed away from the desk. She didn't know where Mr. X had been headed, but he hadn't seemed like the waiting around type. She would head back to Irons' office and see if Sherry had come back, or Irons for that matter. If X was still there, she could always run. Besides, I should have searched his office, try to find something about the stars. There's nothing here that can tell me anything. Standing, she took a last look around, wishing that the star's office had offered a little more in the way of supplies or information. All she'd found of any use was a discarded fanny pack in the desk behind Chris's. According to the expired library card in one of the pouches, it had belonged to Jill Valentine. Claire had never met her, but Chris had mentioned her a couple of times, said she was good with her gun. Too bad she didn't leave one behind. The team had obviously cleared out all of the important stuff after their suspension, although there were still a surprising number of personal items left around, framed pictures and coffee mugs and the like. She'd spotted Barry's desk right away from the partly finished plastic gun model on top. Barry Burton was one of Chris's closest friends, a huge, friendly bear of a man and a serious gun nut. Claire hoped that wherever Chris was, Barry was with him, watching his back, 
with a rocket launcher. And speaking of... On top of everything else, she needed to find another weapon, or more ammo for the 9mm. She had 13 bullets left, one full clip, and when those were gone, she was SOL. Maybe she should stop and check some of the corpses on the way back to the East Wing. Even in her panicked run, she'd noticed that some of them were cops and the handgun was an RPD issue. Claire didn't like the idea of touching any of the dead bodies, but running out of firepower was distinctly less desirable, particularly with Mr. X running around. Claire walked toward the door and pushed it open, trying to get her thoughts organized as she stepped back into the dim hall. Leaving the office put a damper on her resolve. She had to suppress a shudder at the still vivid image of Mr. X as she closed the door behind her, suddenly feeling vulnerable again. She turned right and started back toward the library, deciding that she wouldn't think about the giant unless she had to. Wouldn't dwell on the memory of those blank, inhuman eyes, or the way he'd raised his terrible fist as if driven to destroy anything in his way. So knock it off already. Think about Sherry. Think about getting some goddamn ammo or how to handle irons if you can find him. Think about trying to stay alive. Just ahead, the dark wooden hall turned right again and Claire tried to steel herself against the task at hand. If memory served, there was a dead cop around the corner and, like I can't tell by the smell, and she'd have to search him. He hadn't been too disgusting at least, not that she'd noticed. Claire turned the corner and froze, staring, her stomach knotting, telling her that she was in danger before her senses could. The body that she'd jumped over on the way to the star's office was now only a bloody, tangled mess, flesh and broken limbs and shredded uniform. The head was gone, although there was nowhere to tell if he'd been taken away or just smashed into an unrecognizable pulp. It looked like someone had taken a sledgehammer or an axe to the corpse in a few moments before she'd passed it, beating it to a clotted smear. But when? How? I didn't hear anything. Something moved. A shadow, soft and darting over the mashed remains, some twenty feet in front of her. At the same time, Claire heard a strange, rasping sound. Breathing. And she looked up, still not sure what she was seeing or hearing. The ragged breathing and the tick of talons on wood. The talons themselves, thick and curved. The claws of a creature that couldn't exist. Big, the size of a full-grown man. But the resemblance ended there. And it was so impossible that she could only see it in pieces. Her mind struggling to put them together. The inflamed, purplish flesh of the naked, long-limbed creature that clung to the ceiling. The puffed, grey-white tissue of the partially exposed brain. The scar-rimmed holes where the eyes should have been. Not seeing this, the creature's rounded head dropped back, the wide jaw opening, a ropey stream of dark drool pouring out and splattering over what was left of the cop. It extended its tongue, eely and pink, the rough surface shimmering wetly as it slithered out, and out and out the snaking tongue uncoiling and whipping from side to side, so long that it actually trailed through the ripped flesh of the corpse. Still frozen, Claire watched in horrified disbelief as the incredible tongue snapped back up, flicking droplets of blood through the shadowy air. The entire process had taken only a second, but time had slowed to a crawl, Claire's heart beating so fast that everything else was in slow motion. Even the creature's drop to the wooden floor, its body flipping in midair so that it landed in a crouch atop the mutilated cop. The creature opened its mouth again and screamed. And Claire was finally able to move as the bizarre, hollow shriek erupted from the monster, able to point her weapon and fire. The thunder of 9mm rounds drowned out the howl that echoed through the tight hallway. Bam! 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 And still screaming that chilling, trumpeting cry, the creature was thrown back, 
its claw-tipped arms flailing, its spasming legs kicked up bloody chunks of the eviscerated body. Claire saw a ragged flap of scalp, one ear still attached, fly across the hall and smack into the wall with a wet, slapping sound, sliding down. And the creature got its legs beneath it somehow, and flopped forward in a boneless lunge. It spidered toward her, lightning fast, gripping the wood floor with its terrible claws and howling. Claire fired again, unaware that she was also screaming as three more rounds hit the scuttling thing, ripping through the grey matter that protruded from its open skull. She was going to die. It would be on her in less than a second, and its massive talons were only inches from her legs. And as suddenly as the attack had come, it was over. Every part of the sinewy body quivered and shook as liquid grey dribbled from its burbling head the thick claws tapping wildly against the wood floor in a frantic tattoo. With a final, whispering whine, the creature died. There was no mistaking it this time. She blasted through its brain. It wasn't going to get up again. She stared down at the monster, her shocked mind digging for something to relate it to, some animal or even a rumour of an animal that came close. But she gave it up after a few seconds recognizing it as a lost cause. This was no natural creature, and as close as it was, she could finally smell it. The odor was not as pungent as the zombies. It was a bitter, oily smell, somehow more chemical than animal. And it could smell like chocolate chip cookies. Who gives a shit? Raccoon City's got monsters. It's time to stop being so goddamn surprised when you see one of them. The chiding tone in her mind's voice wasn't particularly convincing. As much as she wanted to feel brave and determined to step over the monstrous creature and to get on with things, she just stood for a moment. And for that moment, she thought very seriously about going back to the star's office, going inside and locking the door behind her. She could hide, hide and wait for help. She could be safe. Decide then. Do something. One way or another, stop this wavering and whining because it's not just you anymore. Will Sherry be safe? Do you want to survive at the cost of her life? The moment passed. Claire took a careful step over the raw, red flesh of the creature and crouched down next to the cop's remains. Using the muzzle of the handgun to push a torn piece of the bloody uniform aside, she swallowed down bile as she poked through the rotten flesh and bone working hard not to think about who the cop had been or how he had died. Nothing, and she now had only seven bullets left, but she refused to panic, letting the disappointment fuel her determination instead. If she could search one bloody mess, she could search another. With a last look at the dead animal thing, Claire stood and walked quickly toward the end of the corridor. Her decision made, no hiding and no more running from the fear. At the very least, she could take a few of the monsters with her, raising Sherry's chances of escape. It could be better to die trying than to not at all. She wouldn't waver again. Chapter 14 ends with us finally seeing a liquor, and I am very happy about that. Liquors, to me, are one of the greatest horror moments in Resident Evil, um, particularly Resident Evil 2, particularly Jack. My brother, you know that that goddamn bit that you showed me when I was a kid and I wasn't ready for it when you're in the interrogation room and it bursts through the window, scared the poop out of me. It was terrifying, utterly terrifying. (sighs) And I love seeing it. And I I like the fact that we got some horror. It it was just about how scary it is to come into contact with a monster like a liquor. You know, and I think this is the thing with books. Books, I, I quite like kind of action or horror elements in books and I'm aware that sometimes you can't do the same things because you're reading you can't you know just like have big long descriptions of how they ran up a wall they shot over here they then ducked under this table you know it it, it sort of doesn't work in prose as much you have to kind of truncate your action a lot more so it ends up a lot shorter uh, so that you don't just have these tedious paragraphs of explaining where people moved which can often also get quite confusing but I, I think that that scene did it quite well I think we put the emphasis on the bits we needed the desperation of Claire the fact that it was really fast but it was like 
hard and that she's been left in a worse situation afterwards gives you the gravity of the situation even though it is short. At least that's what I think. How did you guys find it? Did you enjoy that sequence? Um, I'm certainly... Man, I think I'm a little bit disappointed, maybe, that it, it came this late on in, in the book. It, like, you know, we're sort of getting towards the halfway point, and I would have... I don't like the fact that the liquors had been mentioned multiple times already, and that was the only time we'd seen one. But, but hey, hey, I'm, I'm happy that we've had one now. Also, the scene of Claire digging through what the remains of the corpse, I am very happy to see that. That's a part of... Resident, all Resident Evil games, really, and a lot of games, in fact, actually, that doesn't get spoken about. How much you have to touch corpses and what you have to do to get loot. Um, do you like that? Do you sort of... How do you feel in games when you're playing a game and you're picking something off a dead body? Do you ever think about what you would be like to be in that situation of actually having to move them to touch their cold, clammy skin to smell the scent of decay on your fingers as you rummage for the items that may save your life. D -d Does it feel as dramatic as that, or is it just like, nah, mate, it's a game, I'm getting my items, shut up. Let me know. And we'll move on to chapter 15. Leon found Ada in the kennel straining to lever up the rusted manhole cover that the reporter had told them about. She'd turned up a crowbar from somewhere and had wedged it between the thick iron plate, her well-defined biceps lightly sheened with sweat as she worked the bar. She'd managed to raise the cover about an inch, but let it drop back into place as he walked in, the metallic clang loud in the cold, empty room. Before he could say anything, she lay the crowbar on the cement floor and looked up at him with a strained, half-smile, brushing at her rust-dirty hands. I'm glad you're here. I don't think I'm strong enough to do this by myself. He hadn't been sure before, but the helpless look she gave him cinched it. She was playing him. Or trying to. He'd known Ada for all of twenty minutes, but he doubted, seriously, that she'd ever been helpless about anything. Looks like you're doing just fine, he said, holstering the magnum, but not making any move toward the manhole. He crossed his arms, frowning slightly. He wasn't angry, just curious. Besides, what's the hurry? I thought you wanted to talk to the reporter. About John, your umbrella friend? The woman in distress look melted away, and her delicate features turned cool and hard, but not in a bad way. It was as though she was letting her real self show, the strong and self-assured Ada he'd first met. Leon could tell that he'd surprised her by not rushing to her aid, and was glad to see it. He had enough to worry about without being manipulated by a mysterious stranger. She'd been very careful to avoid his questions, but it was time for Ms. Wong to explain a few things. Ada stood up, meeting his gaze evenly. You heard him. He wasn't going to tell us anything. And with this place as dangerous as it is, I don't really want to stand around waiting for him to develop a conscience. She dropped her gaze, her voice softening. And I don't even know if John's in Raccoon, but I do know that he's not here, and I want to leave before the station's completely overrun. It sounded good, but for some reason... He had the feeling that she was holding something back. For a few seconds, he struggled to think of a polite way to get her to open up, then decided to hell with it. Under the circumstances, social graces would have to be suspended. What's going on, Ada? Do you know something you're not telling me? She looked at him again and again. He had the feeling that he'd surprised her, but her cool, dark gaze was as unreadable as ever. I just want to get out of here, she said, and the sincerity of her tone was impossible to deny. If he didn't believe anything else she'd said, he had to believe that. And I wish it was that easy, but there's Claire, and even Ben, our asshole friend, and God knows how many others. Leon shook his head. I can't leave. Like I said, I may be the only cop left around here. If there are still people in the building, I have to at least try to help them and I think it'd be best if you came with me. Ada gave him another one of her half-smiles. I appreciate your concern, Leon, but I can take care of myself. He didn't doubt it, 
but he also didn't want to see her abilities tested. Granted, he was pretty untested himself, but he'd been trained to deal with crisis situations. It was his job. And to be honest with yourself, you lost Claire. You couldn't help Branna, and Ben Bertolucci could give a rat's ass for your protection skills. You don't want to fail with Ada on top of all that. And you don't want to be alone. Ada seemed to know what he was thinking. Before he could come up with a convincing argument, she stepped forward and put one slender hand on his arm, the humor fading from her bright eyes. I know you want to do your job here, but you said it yourself. We have to find a way out of Raccoon, try and get outside help, and the sewers are probably the best chance we've got. The light, gentle touch surprised him and sent an electric flutter through his belly, an unexpected flush of warmth that left him feeling confused and uncertain. He managed to keep his reaction from showing, but just barely. Ada continued, frowning thoughtfully. How about this? Help me with the manhole cover, and let's see what's down there. If it looks dangerous, I'll come with you. But if it's not bad, well, we can talk about what to do next. He wanted to protest, but the truth was, he couldn't make her do anything she didn't want to do, and he wanted very much for her to know that he wasn't some overbearing macho type, that he was receptive to compromise. And does the name John ring a bell? This isn't a date for Christ's sake, stop thinking with your hormones! Feeling awkward, even thinking about it, with her hand still on his arm, Leon stepped away, nodding briskly. Together, they crouched down next to the manhole. Leon picked up the crowbar and jammed one end beneath the lid. As he pulled back, Ada pushed on the bar, and with a heavy grating sound, the thick metal plate came up. Leon put his back into it and heaved the lid to one side, clearing the opening. And both of them recoiled back from the smell that bellowed out of the dark hole. A choking, dark stench of blood, piss, and vomit. Yeah, what is that? Leon coughed. Ada sat back on her heels, one hand pressed to her mouth. The bodies from the garage, they must have dumped them down here. Before he could ask what she was talking about, a scream of pure terror echoed through the basement halls, filtering through the closed door. The cry went on and on, a man's voice, the panic scream suddenly changing to a gurgling shriek of pain. The reporter! Leon locked gazes with Ada, saw the same startled realization flash across her face. And then they were both up and running, pulling out their weapons and sprinting through the door before the echoes died. I left him! And I shouldn't have left him! They ran down the corridor for the cell block, guilt driving Leon to run faster than he thought he could. Someone or something had gotten to Bertolucci and had passed right behind his back to do it. Sherry stood in Mr. Irons' office, rubbing at her good look pendant and wishing that Claire would come back. She had crawled through a dozen dusty tunnels to get away from the monster and to lead it away from Claire, and was pretty sure it had worked. She hadn't heard it again and had come back to find that Claire had left. If the monster had found her, she would have been dead and ripped apart. But she's not here. Nobody is. Sherry sat on the edge of a low table in the middle of the room, wondering what she should do. She'd gotten used to being alone, and hadn't even realized how lonely she'd been. But meeting Claire had changed that. Sherry wanted to see her again. She wanted to be with other people. She wanted her parents so bad that it made her ache. Even Mr. Irons would be okay, although Sherry didn't like him. She'd only met him a couple of times, but he was weird, showy, and fake and his office was creepy besides. Still, she gladly put up with him if it meant she didn't have to be alone anymore. Footsteps, in the hall, outside of the office. Sherry stood up and ran to the open door that led back to the armor room, hoping it was Claire and ready to sprint for cover if it wasn't. She ducked around the doorframe and held her breath, staring at the stuffed tiger in the hall and silently praying. The outer door opened and closed, muffled steps on the carpet, moving slowly, and she tensed to run. 
at the same time trying to muster up enough courage to sneak a look. Sherry? Claire! I'm here! She ran back into the office and there was Claire, her whole face lit up with a beaming smile. Sherry flew into her open arms, so happy to see her that she wanted to cry. I was looking for you, Claire said, holding her tightly. Don't run off like that again, okay? Claire knelt in front of her, still smiling, but Sherry could see the worry behind the smile and in her cool grey eyes. I'm sorry, Sherry said. I had to, or the monster would have come. What does it look like? Claire asked, her smile fading. Does it look kind of red? With claws? Sherry swallowed heavily. The Inside Out Men! You saw one, didn't you? Claire grinned, shaking her head. Yep, that's exactly what I saw. An Inside Out Man, good description. She looked at Sherry more seriously, frowning. Men? There are more of them? Sherry nodded. Yes, but they aren't anything like the monster. I only saw him once, from behind. But he's a man. A giant man. Claire seemed excited. Bald? Wearing a long coat? No, he had hair. Brown hair. And one of his arms was all screwed up. A lot longer than the other one. Claire sighed. Terrific. Raccoon's got something for everyone, sounds like. She reached out and took Sherry's hand, squeezing it. And that's all the more reason that you should stay with me. You've done a really good job of taking care of yourself, and you've been very brave. But until we find your parents, I feel like it's my job for now to watch out for you. And if the monster does come, I'll... I'll kick its ass, okay? Sherry laughed, surprised into it. She liked that Claire didn't talk down to her. She nodded and squeezed Claire's hand again. Good. So we got zombies, inside out man, and a monster, and a big bald guy. Sherry, do you know what happened to Raccoon? How this all got started? Anything you can tell me, anything at all, it could be important. Sherry frowned, thinking. Well, there were a bunch of murderers last May, or June, I think. Like, like ten people got killed, and then they stopped. But then maybe a week ago, somebody got attacked. Claire nodded encouragingly. Okay, did more people start getting attacked? Or what did the police do? Sherry shook her head, wishing she could be more helpful. I don't know. Right before that girl got attacked, my mother called from work really upset and told me that I couldn't leave the house. Mrs. Willis, that's our next door neighbor, she came over and cooked dinner for me. That's how I heard about that girl. Mom called again the next day and told me that she and Dad were stuck at the plant and wouldn't be home for a while. And then, like three days ago, she called again and told me to come here. I went to see if Mrs. Willis would come with me, but her house was dark and empty. I guess things had already gotten pretty bad by then. Claire was staring at her intently. You were alone? All that time? Even before you got to the station? Well... Yeah, but I stay alone a lot. My parents are both scientists. The, their work is important, and, and sometimes they can't stop in the middle of what they're doing. And my mother always says that I'm very self-sufficient when I want to be. Do you know what kind of work your parents do at Umbrella? Claire was still watching her closely. They develop cures for things, like diseases, Sherry said proudly, and make medicines, like serums that hospitals use. She trailed off, noticing that Claire seemed distracted suddenly, her gaze far away. It was a look she had seen plenty of times before, on both her parents' faces, and it meant that they weren't really listening anymore. But as soon as she stopped talking, Claire refocused on her, reaching out to pat her on the shoulder, and for some stupid reason, that made Sherry want to cry again. Because she's listening to me, because she wants to watch out for me right now. Your mother's right. Claire said gently. You're very self-sufficient, and you've made it this far, that means that you're very strong. That's good, because we're both going to have to be strong to make it out of here. Sherry felt her eyes go wide. What do you mean? Leave the station? But there are zombies all over the place. I don't know where my parents are. What if they need help, or, or they're looking for me? Sweetie, I'm sure your folks are just fine. 
Claire said quickly. They're probably still at the plant, hiding and safe, just like you were, waiting for people to come from outside of the city to, to make everything better. You mean kill everything? Sherry said. I'm twelve, you know. I'm not a baby. Claire smiled. Sorry. Yeah, to kill everything. But until the good guys come, we're on our own. And the best thing we can do, the smartest thing, is to get out of their way, to get as far out of their way as possible. You're right. The streets aren't safe, but maybe we can get a car. It was Claire's turn to trail off. She stood up and walked toward the big desk at the end of the office, looking around as she went. Maybe Chief Irons left his car keys here, or another weapon, something we can use. Claire saw something on the floor behind the desk. She crouched down, and Sherry hurried after her, as much to stay close as to see what she'd found. She already knew that she didn't want to lose her again, no matter what else happened. There's blood here, Claire said softly, so softly that Sherry thought she hadn't meant to say it out loud. So? Claire looked up at the plain tan wall, frowning, then back down at the big, dryest splotch of red on the floor. It's still wet, for one thing. And see the way it's just kind of cut off? See, there should be some on the wall here. She rapped on the dark wood grain that lined the wall, and then on the wall itself. There was an obvious difference. A dull thump from the trim. But the wall sounded hollow. Is there a room back there? Sherry asked. I don't know. It sounds like it. And it would explain where he took where he took off to earlier, at Chief Irons. She glanced up at Sherry as she started to feel along the baseboards, running her hands off the wall and pushing at it. Sherry, look around the desk. See if you can find like a switch or a lever. My guess is it would be hidden somewhere, maybe in one of the drawers. Sherry started to move behind the desk and tripped, her foot sliding on a handful of pencils that she hadn't seen. She grabbed at the desktop, trying to catch her balance, but came down pretty hard on her bare knees. Ow! Claire was next to her right away, putting an arm around her shoulders. Are you okay? Yeah, I just... Hey, look! Her bruised knees forgotten, Sherry pointed at the switch under the top drawer of the desk, set into a small metal plate. It looked like a light switch, but it had to be for the secret door. She just knew it. I found it! Claire reached out, and flipped the switch, and behind them, a section of the wall a few feet across slid smoothly upwards, disappearing into the ceiling and exposing a dimly lit room lined with oversized bricks. Cool, damp air breezed into the office. It was a secret passage, just like in the movies. Together, they stood and stepped toward the opening, Claire holding Sherry back with one arm until she looked first. The small room was totally empty three brick walls and a stained wood floor, and only about half the size of the office. The fourth wall was dominated by a big, old-fashioned elevator gate, the kind that pushed to one side. Are we going to take it? Sherry asked. She was excited, but nervous too. Claire had taken her gun out. She crouched down next to Sherry and smiled, but it wasn't a happy smile, and Sherry knew what was coming before Claire said a word. Sweetie? I think it would be safest if I went and looked around first, and you stayed here. But you said we should stay together. You said we could find a car and leave. What if the monster comes back and, and you're not here, or you get killed? Claire hugged her, but Sherry felt almost sick with helpless anger. She was going to tell her not to worry, that the monster wouldn't come, that nothing bad would happen, and then she was going to leave anyway. Stupid grown-up lies! Claire leaned back, smoothing Sherry's hair away from her face. I don't blame you for being scared. I'm scared too. This is a bad situation. And honestly, I don't know what's going to happen. But I want to do the right thing by you. And that means that I'm not going to take you into a situation where you could get hurt. Not if I can help it. Sherry swallowed back tears, trying again. But I want to come with you. What if you don't come back? I'm going to come back, Claire said firmly. I promise. And if I don't, I want you to hide again, like before. Somebody will come, 
Help is going to come soon, and they'll find you. At least she was being honest. Sherry didn't like it. Not at all. But at least there was that. And from the look on her face, Sherry could see that there was nothing she could say to change her mind. She could be a baby about it, or she could accept it. Be careful, she whispered. And Claire hugged her again before standing and moving toward the elevator. She pushed a button next to the gate, and there was a low, soft hum. After a few seconds, an elevator car rose into view, coming to a gentle stop. Claire pulled the gate open and stepped inside, turning for a last look at Sherry. Stay here, sweetie, she said. I'll be back in a few minutes. Sherry forced herself to nod, and Claire let the gate close. She touched something inside the elevator, and the car went down, her smiling, strong face descending out of sight, leaving Sherry by herself in the cold, dark passage. Sherry sat down on the dusty floor and hugged her knees close to her body, rocking herself slowly. Claire was brave and smart. She'd be back soon. She had to come back. I want my mommy, Sherry whispered, but there was nobody to hear. She was alone again, the thing she wanted least of all. But I'm strong. I'm strong and I can wait. She rested her chin on one knee, touching the necklace her mother had given her for good luck, and started to wait for Claire to come back. And that ends chapter 15, the chapter where you have to listen to a man in his 30s do his best to sound like a 12-year-old American girl. I'm doing my best, but my best is far from the greatest. Um, I enjoyed that chapter, um, not a huge amount, more sort of practical things. We're seeing them moving on to the next areas that we're going to explore. So we're seeing the sewers, and then we've also got Claire heading down as well. I'm trying to remember where that uh, elevator comes out. Uh, I, I'm not remembering. So that'll be something for me to discover as we go on. Um, Ada, I enjoyed Ada. I like the fact that Leon isn't being manipulated by Ada. I like the fact that he just... Yep, I know, you're trying to, you know, mess me around. Um, however, I do like that we also get in there that he's kind of, like, really into her. Um, it is a little odd that, that that moment where, like, she touches his arm and he's like, Man, all of a sudden, yeah, there's this zombie thing, but I'm kind of horny. Um, well, horny, I don't know. He seemed a bit infatuated with her. A little bit, uh, he's getting a little crushed there. And uh, this isn't really the atmosphere that I think really makes romance happen. What do you think? Do you think that you could somehow find love, or at least find attraction, a crush, uh, during a zombie apocalypse? Or do you think that would be completely out of your mind whilst you're running away from the living dead? While you're mumbling over that question, we'll move on to chapter 16, which sees us joining Annette Birkin, Sherry's mother. Annette Birkin sat in the laboratory monitor room, exhausted, staring up at the wall of video screens centered over the surveillance console. She'd been there for what felt like years, waiting for William to appear, and was starting to think that he would never. She'd give it a little longer, but if she didn't see him soon, she'd have to do another search. The goddamn technology! It was a brand new system, less than a month old, 25 screens with a channel control that should have allowed her to see any and every part of the facility. A brilliant security advance, except only 11 of the screens still worked at all, and over half of those would only show static, an endless dance of electric snow. Of the five she could still get a clear picture from, all she could see, all there was to see, were dead, rotting bodies and the occasional RE3, either feasting or sleeping. Lickers. You call them lickers because of their tongues. She thought she'd been past the worst of the pain, but the lonely sound of her own voice in the cold, cavernous chamber, and the realization that there would be no answer, that there would never be an answer ever again, brought on a fresh, knifing wave of grief. William was gone. He was gone, and she was talking to no one at all. Annette lowered her head to the console, closing her weary eyes. At least there were no more tears. She'd wept an ocean of them in the days since Umbrella had come for the G-Virus, but was simply too spent to cry anymore. Now, there was only pain, interspersed with fits of violent, 
helpless fury over what Umbrella had done. Another month, maybe two, and we would have given it to them. We would have turned it over without a fight, and William would have made the executive board and he would have been happy. Everybody would have been happy. There was a faint squealing from one of the muted security screens. Annette looked up, hoping and dreading at once, but it was just a liquor. It had dropped from its ceiling roost to snack on one of the techs, howling stupidly to itself as it ripped into the corpse's guts. The dead man looked like Don Weller, one of the chemical plant go-betweens, but you couldn't tell for certain. He was almost as mutilated and inhuman looking as the RE3 that was eating him. She watched the liquor feed, watched the small screen, but didn't really see. Her mind wandered, running over what was left for her to do. She'd already wiped all of the computers and locked in the countdown codes. The lab was ready, and her escape route was secured. But she couldn't finish things until she saw him again. Saw that he was back in the Umbrella facility. Destroying the lab wouldn't solve anything if he wasn't in the blast zone. They would find him and extract the virus from his blood. An Umbrella won't have it. I'll die before I let them have it, so help me God. Her only consolation in all of this mad, horrible affair was that Umbrella hadn't managed to get their greedy hands on William's synthesis. They hadn't, and they never would. Everything that had gone into the creation of the G-Virus would be buried under a thousand burning tons of stone and wood, along with William and all of the monsters they had created for the company. She would go into hiding for a while, take some time to heal, to consider her options, and then she would sell the G-Virus to the competition. Umbrella was the biggest, but they weren't the only conglomerate working on bioweapons research, and when she was through with them, they wouldn't be the biggest anymore. It wasn't much of a revenge, but it was all she had left. Except for Sherry, Annette whispered, and the thought of her young daughter made her heart ache. A different pain, but pain nonetheless. Since the day Sherry had been born, Annette had meant to spend more time with her, to focus on the child instead of on her part in William's brilliant work. And yet, somehow the years had slipped by. William's promotions had kept coming up, the work had grown ever more interesting and valuable, and although both she and William had made promises to themselves and each other that they would make more of an effort to develop their family life, they had continued to put it off. And now it's too late. We'll never be a family. We'll never be parents together. All that time wasted, slaving for a company that sold us out in the end. It was too late. There was no point in mourning what could have been. All she could do now was make sure that Umbrella didn't get anything else from the Birkin family. William was gone, but there was still Sherry. That part of him would go on, and Annette meant to finally become the mother she should have been all along. Of course, she'd have to wait until things cooled down, before she could collect Sherry. At least a few months. But the girl would be safe. The cops would send her to live with William's sister. It was in both of their wills. Unless Irons is still alive. That fat, greedy bastard could find a way to screw up even that if given half a chance. She hoped he was dead. Even if he wasn't directly responsible for Umbrella's awareness of the G-Virus, Brian Irons was a disgusting, arrogant man with the morals of a sea slug. After years of loyalty to the company, he'd been bought out for a measly hundred thousand dollars. Even William had been surprised, and he'd had an even lower opinion of the police chief than she had. On the screen, the RE3 finished its meal. All that was left of the dead man was an empty shell, arched, bloody ribs, and a faceless cup of skull. The surely vibrant colors lost to the video's flat shades of gray. The liquor scrabbled out of view, trailing sticky fluids in its wake. Thanks to the T-Virus, all of the reptile series were efficient killers. Although the threes had design flaws, the protruding cerebellum was the most obvious, but they also had a ridiculously high metabolic rate. Keeping them fed had been a constant hassle. Not a problem anymore. Plenty of carrion to go around, and lucky them, 
They'll get a chance for a hot dinner soon enough. Annette felt drained of energy and didn't want to go back out into the facility, but she couldn't just keep hoping that William would happen by one of the working cameras. She'd heard him up on level three, perhaps two days before, but hadn't seen him in almost twice as long. She couldn't keep waiting. Umbrella's people were probably already working on a way in. Even with the mainframe wiped, there were other ways to get past the doors. And William may have found a way out. I can't keep denying it, no matter how much I want to. There was an abandoned factory west of the lab, a shipping company that had been brought up by Umbrella to ensure that the underground levels would stay secret. It was how Umbrella had managed to build the complex in the first place without arousing suspicion, hiding equipment and materials in the factory's warehouses and using the heavy machinery lift to transport them. Although the entrances from the factory had still been sealed off the last time she'd checked, there was a slim chance that William had gotten through, and if he could get to the factory, he could get into the sewers. Annette forced herself to stand up, ignoring the cramps in her legs and back as she picked up the handgun on the console. She didn't know much about guns, although she'd figured out how to use one quickly enough after... After they came for the G-Virus? The men in gas masks, shooting and running? And William, poor William, dying in a puddle of blood. And I didn't see the syringe until it was too late. She took a deep, shuddering breath, trying to push that terrible memory aside, trying to forget about the incident that had taken William from her and turned Raccoon into a city of the dead. It didn't matter anymore. The journey ahead wouldn't be a pleasant one, and she had to concentrate. Escaped RE3s, first and second stage infected humans, the botany experiments, the arachnid series. She could run into any of the T-Virus carriers, not to mention whomever Umbrella had managed to send. And William, my husband, my beloved, the first human G-Virus carrier who isn't really human anymore. She'd been wrong to think that he had no more tears inside. Annette stood in the middle of the vast, sterile room, five floors beneath the surface of Raccoon, and wept. Lost, racking sobs that didn't even begin to touch the pain of her loneliness. Umbrella would be sorry. Once she could be sure that William was beyond their reach, she was going to destroy their precious facility. She was going to take the G-Virus and run. She was going to make sure that they understood how badly they'd screwed up. And God help anyone who tried to stop her. And that is the end of chapter 16. A short little chapter there introducing uh, Annette and letting us know what has happened to William. So we had William Birkin mentioned, of course, by Irons earlier. But um, we heard about the $100,000 that William paid Irons to help keep the G-Virus safe. But this is our first reveal of William Birkin, the monster. The first explanation, obviously, that he's taken the G-Virus after Umbrella came to collect it. Uh, the men in gas masks, it's our boy Hunk, if y'all remember him. Um, I always used to love playing as Hunk in the Resident Evil 4 uh, Mercenaries mode. Uh, give me a shout out if you like that too. Hunk, best character. Neck snap every time. Um, and uh, actually, I, I bought a gas mask to play, like to pretend to be Hunk uh, when I was like 15 or something. Because that's the kind of nerd I was. Um, so we, we have that mentioned, and so we now have this reveal of it is William going around. We haven't seen him, uh, again, the book often talks about things before they turn up. Um, so I will be interested to see how she describes him. I'm also interested to notice that um, when she's talking about the liquors, Annette mentions them being the reptile series, the reptilians, something along those lines. And I'm... I have never felt, personally, that there is a reptile component to the liquors. I suppose it makes a lot of sense, actually, because they have, like, long tongues and those weird kind of claws, like the three appendages, a bit like a chameleon, almost. Chameleons are the big claws, but they have the weird little mitten-y hands. So perhaps it's supposed to be that they're like that. Um, but I always kind of thought they had human origins with the way that they looked so human-shaped. Other than, you know, like, no skin, no eyes, giant claws, big tongue. 
other than that, you know, and of course the exposed brain. Okay, I get why you might think I'm being stupid for saying that they're kind of human-based. But I, th I thought they were. I thought they were like modified people. Um, so it's going to be interesting to see. I also kind of thought originally um, that the T-virus turned some people into certain things. A bit like the specials in Left for Dead. That it's all the same kind of uh, zombie virus, but some people who are affected because of something in their genetics, I guess, uh, get affected a certain way. Was that how you guys felt it worked? Let me know. Um, this book here, though, seems to be very much no. The things that aren't zombies are built creatures made in a lab, specifically to be unleashed someday. Which makes me question, what the hell was the purpose of a liquor? Slash the purpose of a giant spider. I'm just saying, what military application did you have in mind for your giant bleeding spider? But whilst you guys are mumming that over and deciding whether I'm crazy or not, we'll have to end it there. Because I'm afraid we've come to the end of our three chapters for this episode. It's been a fun episode, and I'm really looking forward to coming back next week. Um, if you've enjoyed this, please, I always ask, share it with someone else who will enjoy. I want to get people listening to these books. I love these books, personally. I would love it if someone listened to this audiobook and then went out and then read the missing book. So we did the first one, and we've done this one, which is the third, but we skipped over number two. Because that's an original story, not based on the games love it if people went out and got those but otherwise please share please let people know if you fancy doing the youtube dance you can of course like subscribe and hit that bell icon otherwise they won't tell you when the videos are out because youtube kind of sucks but for now my friends that's it and i will see you next time